a statewide political machine assembled and fed off the citizens of Tennessee in the early half of the 1900s. Extortion, abuse, and election fraud were the cogs of relentless growth for decades leading into the years of World War II. When the GIs of McMinn County returned home, the machine's brutality increased, and so they organized politically. The chaos of Election Day on August 1st, 1946, culminated into an all-out gunfight siege in the town of Athens. The winner of this fight would secure the vote and fate of the county. How exactly did this happen? Who were the men involved? These details were mostly kept secret until recently, and in this video I get to present to you the story of the Battle of Athens, or McMinn County War. Seeing the story's muddy background, I had to make sure I got things right. I reached out to the director of the McMinn County Living Heritage Museum. She recommended a book that would come out later this year, November 3rd, 2020, by New York Times bestselling author Chris DeRose. I emailed him about my plan for this video, and he was very generous to offer me an early copy of his new book, The Fighting Bunch, The Battle of Athens and How World War II Veterans Won the Only Successful Armed Rebellion Since the Revolution. In this book, he dives into all existing leads, and he was granted access to never-before-revealed first-hand accounts. This video would not have been possible without his work. He even offered to appear in an interview, and segments of that will be played to give you further insight. If you hear something that you want to learn more about, you will definitely find it in his book. There are a lot of names involved in this whole scenario, but the hero of our story is Bill White. Bill was born in 1924 on the Little Tennessee River, which flowed down out of the Cherokee Mountains, but he later moved to Athens with his family as a boy. Bill enjoyed his free time away from hard-working hours by fishing, hunting, and picking blackberries. After coming home from war, he became known for hunting wild hogs with a spear. When Bill was 17, Pearl Harbor compelled him to join the Marines. Bill was among the first forces to fight in Guadalcanal and later Tarawa. He fought with zeal, led a 16-man squad, and even claimed a fancy sword from a fallen Japanese officer. He was sent home against his wishes after two years, four months, and 11 days overseas. What other men of history would you compare to Bill White? Bill White is comparable to millions of anonymous people throughout history who make history happen. Um, I think and I've been guilty of this particularly earlier in my career as a historian, you think of history as being the presidents or the kings or depending on you know, what part of history and where, where you're studying. But really, history turns because of people like Bill White, uh, a 17-year-old boy who responds to Pearl Harbor by lying about his age and joining the Marine Corps and serving in the first offensive action of World War II in the Pacific and fighting in Guadalcanal and fighting on Tarawa and uh, nobody ever knew his name but he and millions of others throughout history have fought for freedom and you know made the world a better place but they don't have statues or streets or schools named after them and so that's why I would compare Bill to I'd compare Bill to uh, millions of other uh, brave and hard-working people who have, have who are responsible for the world that we enjoy today, but who um, are not generally regarded as major historical figures of significance. While McMinn County had a little over 3,000 good men go and fight the war, there were plenty remaining who took the opportunity to solidify power as a local branch of the corrupt E.H. Crump machine. Edward Hull Boss Crump was a poor man from Mississippi who became a bookkeeper and married a wealthy merchant's daughter. He became a councilman in 1905 and was elected to the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners, where he deputized 20 officers and led three raids. This turned out to be a stunt, as it became an open secret later that he would not enforce laws against gambling and instead collecting a 40% fee. Saloon closing laws were also not enforced, and the locations that he controlled began running political activities guarded by Crump loyal deputies. Soon enough, all Memphis City employees were involved in these elections and had to vote for the right person. As a strategy for continued growth of the machine, E.H. Crump 
would focus on getting his candidates of choosing elected sheriff. From there, they could fill their pockets and finance new campaigns by extorting businesses and charging fees per arrest. This brought in a huge amount of money and gave incentive to abuse. In McMinn County alone, from 1936 to 1946, the sheriff's office and deputies pocketed $335,291.50, which is equivalent to nearly $4.5 million today. To put this into perspective, the sheriff of McMinn was making more money than the vice president of the United States. Crump gained control over the entire state, freely selecting candidates or punishing disloyalty. It got to the point where he wielded this power without holding any elected office. While the machine itself was Crump's, in McMinn County it was led by a man named Paul Cantrell. He started as sheriff, but eventually took office as state senator. He was also the chairman of the McMinn County Court and chairman of the McMinn Democratic Party. Cantrell's deputies were harsh to the local people. Anyone who spoke up was beaten over the head, and deputies were not afraid to use their firearms to intimidate or even shoot their opposition. As election days came, deputies secured polling places. They would allow ineligible people to vote, deny eligible voters, and count inaccurately. Poll watchers would also get beaten and arrested for noticing these irregularities. There was a pattern of blatant cheating, enforcing the cheating with violence, and then using the chaos they created as an excuse to close the polls and count in secret. This had been going on for a while, and so by the time of our story in 1946, I need to lay out some context for the election. Sheriff Cantrell became senator, and his loyal replacement was Pat Mansfield. They planned to now switch seats this upcoming election so that Cantrell could return to sheriff and amass power before aiming to become governor. Mansfield would then become senator. Since they completely dominated the voting process for so long, these elections would be a simple formality. If you are wondering where the DOJ was, it was being constantly pushed into pursuing these crimes by a man called Judge Jennings, who was by this time a congressman but preferred the name Judge. After years of him pleading, the DOJ summarized its findings as, quote, the alleged violations in McMinn County were the worst ever brought to the attention of the Department of Justice. Jennings is an interesting character. He's uh, known as the five J's of Jellico because he's Judge John J. Jennings Jr. of Jellico which is the town he lived in in Tennessee. And he's actually a member of Congress during the events of this book, but he preferred his title of judge to congressman. And so he was a Republican and he didn't rely on the Crump machine for his time in office. Um, he was one of the few elected officials in Tennessee that you know, didn't matter. East Tennessee was so Republican that even boss Crump and his minions couldn't steal it. From, from Jennings. And as you know from reading the book, they tried. Um, they made great efforts to try to steal the elections from Jennings and were unsuccessful. And so uh, Jennings made speeches in the House of Representatives. He would routinely bring uh, these matters to the attention of uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI and various attorney general of the United, various attorneys general of the United States uh, and officials of the Department of Justice. Um, you know, and, and sometimes he could shake them into, into action, but generally speaking, he couldn't. While at war, some of these men received letters from home about the harassment getting worse and worse for their families. While home on leave, a serviceman named Earl Ford was shot and killed. As more returned home, this reality was made obvious. Some were arrested immediately after walking off the bus for drunkenness or having a beer. It did not take long for them to begin meeting and organizing politically, to form their own ticket for the next election. They primarily sought to take over the sheriff's office, with their man Knox Henry from the Army Air Corps. Their slogan was simple, vote GI, your vote will be counted as cast. I said, well, I said, uh, here you are. I said, back in McMinn County, here in Athens. I said, after going overseas, Stay in three or four years over our fight for your country. And I said, a lot of you died, a lot of you wounded. And I said, you survived, you came back. And I said, you, I said, you fought 
that you had some freedom in this country, but I said, you come back and said you didn't have no freedom at all. Election day was a powder keg. Sheriff Pat Mansfield assembled an army from the nearby police forces and prisons. Some of the men were even prisoners released just for the election. In total, he had 250 men at the machine's disposal. Here, I will put a spoiler warning for the book. This video does not nearly cover all the details available in Krista Rose's book, and I highly recommend you pick it up. If you don't want the main details and outcome of the story spoiled, you can stop the video now. But with that warning out of the way, let's continue. A local 60-year-old farming man named Tom Gillespie came to vote for Knox Henry. He was stopped by Deputy Wendy Wise, who insulted him, punched him in the face with brass knuckles, and then shoved him out onto the ground. Mr. Gillespie stood up and defiantly went back inside where he leaned up against the wall. Deputy Wise, now infuriated, then drew his handgun and shot him. Shy Scott was a combat pilot who captained a B-17 and was now a GI election judge. Ed Vestal was a platoon commander in the Pacific and a combat engineer with two Purple Hearts, who was now the GI election clerk. They were both taken hostage by deputies while pole watching. The men who came to rescue them were also threatened at gunpoint, but when two newsmen showed up outside, Scott decided that he had to make an escape. He ran and managed to smash through the glass door, with both men falling outside quickly standing up and walking away with their arms raised. Deputy Wise aimed right at Scott's back and nearly fired until another deputy stopped him. As described earlier, the familiar pattern played out. The cheating was done blatantly and in the open, and then enforced with violence against anyone who noticed. They were well aware of the GI campaign, and once they felt outnumbered by the crowd, they used that chaotic moment as an excuse to secure the ballots. A large portion of the ballots were brought to the jailhouse, which is the stage for our main event. The men back at GI campaign headquarters were soon approached by two deputies. The GIs, who were now justifiably angry, disarmed, beat, and held them hostage. More deputies arrived and were also taken. Soon all seven deputies were driven out to the woods and tied naked to trees. Bill White had enough at this point and returned to the headquarters meeting up with a group of ready men. They held an assortment of firearms but needed more. Luckily, a local drove them a mile west of town toward the National Guard Armory. Once there, they broke in and secured a bunch of 30 caliber M1917 rifles and a Thompson submachine gun, along with plenty of ammo. Jimmy Lockmiller, one of the GIs, took two 45 Colt revolvers to hide under the Hawaiian shirt that he was wearing for the party. The men returned to town and converged onto the jailhouse. Their principal position is going to be on an embankment across the street from the jail. So you get the jail, you kind of picture a big haunted house as like the principal building of the jail. It's a big, scary looking brick building. And across the street, you have uh, an embankment, like a little hill, maybe 13 feet high. And that embankment was the backyard of a boarding house. And so it's, it's almost directly across from the jail. It's a, a very defensible position. You have trees and bushes and vines where you could take cover and you could shoot at the jail without being seen or, or without, um, you know, with cover. And um, that's where they'll go and they'll demand the ballot boxes from the jail. And so there's some words exchanged back and forth. It's clear that they're not gonna give them a fair count or bring the ballot boxes out of the jail. Then the shooting starts. All the decades of fraud, assault, and fleecing of the people came to a boiling point at this moment, as Bill White finally raised his rifle, aimed, and... <laughs> ammunition was now hailed onto the jailhouse and shot back by the deputies. The GIs were fully committed to a fight that erupted in the small town. One man tried to flee the jail but was shot in the leg and laid on the ground for hours. The Thompson clattered and the rifles popped with proficient reload times. The hours pressed on into the night as hundreds of rounds were expended. The GIs even threw Molotov cocktails at police cars, setting them ablaze. Even though media was there, only one authentic photo exists of the fight. 
your book mentions one existing photo from the battle. And I have the photo here. And can you just confirm this is this is the real photo and tell us what you know about it? Yeah, that's the real photo. So remember the principal GI position is in the backyard of a boarding house on the embankment on a hill, which is the backyard of a boarding house. And so unfortunately, when the battle begins, the resident of the boarding house is a, is a, a mother who's, whose husband is still away in the army. And she's got like five kids when the battle breaks out. So she has to get her five kids out of the house when the shooting starts. And so if you see these guys, their rifles are pointed at the jail. You can see which direction of the jail is from them. Jail's right across the street from, from where the rifles are pointed. And so that, was that, that kind of gunfire was hitting that house when the battle started. And so once the, the, the mom, the Wilson family, once the mom was able to get her Wilson children out of the house, um, three of the GIs went in and, and took over that position because it was a, an advantageous position for firing on the jail. And so they were followed by a, a photographer from the Knoxville Journal. Um, and so he, the Knoxville Journal photographer takes this iconic photograph. It is the only photograph of the Battle of Athens as it's being fought. There are some others out there that are staged, that are very clearly not a picture of people in battle, uh, even though they were, they were captioned that way. This is the only photo. And so what you see is the man with um, a sh shirt over his head. That's David Hutzel. So David Hutzel had been a rifleman in the Army. And he is one of the principal leaders of uh, the Battle of Athens. And then you have uh, Ken Mashburn um, and Sam Sims. And, and Sam is the, the guy in the, the Navy outfit. Sam and his brothers served in the Navy. He served with uh, five brothers and their father signed up as well. Um, and so all three of them signed affidavits, which I was able to get my hands on talking about what happened in the house that night. Um, they're actually in the collection of the uh, Bill White's personal papers. But also David Hutzel, who's the one standing with a shirt over his head, he told his family members the story. And so they were able to tell me, and in fact, I have photographs holding David Hutzel's rifle, which are still in, still in his family. The rifle that he used? Yeah, the rifle that he's using in that photograph. Oh, I've wow. Picture, I've got a picture with that rifle. His family still has it. Um, and see, the three of them went and took over that position overlooking the jail. Um, and their names had never been uh, released before. So I was able to put it together both between David Hutzel's account of what happened as well as the affidavits that were signed by Ken Mashburn and Sam Sims. And um, Sam doesn't have any living relatives, but in David's case and in, and in uh, Ken's case, I was able to verify their signature with their family members just to prove that it was, it was a match. Just outside in the inky blackness. At that time, our listeners heard something like this. Eastern Standard Time as we take you to Allen South somewhere in McMahon County. Come in, Allen. And gentlemen, suddenly a hubbub of activity has taken place here. One of the loudest explosions we have heard the firing started. There is another one. The people are running, uh, are yelling, and we don't know what the activity is, but there has been sporadic firing up as well. There is another shot. Oh, thanks for the Deputies from inside threatened to execute some hostages held inside the jail, but that threat was met with gunfire and luckily not carried out. One machine man got on the phone to call the National Guard for help, but was shot through the thumb and jaw. Still, the National Guard was indeed preparing to come, and the GIs were aware of this. Getting anxious to get this over with, Ken Mashburn told Bill White where they could get some dynamite. They returned with it throwing sticks that exploded near the jail. Then they threw a bundle of five sticks at the porch. This explosion rocked the foundation, nearly knocking the porch off. Realizing the need to keep momentum up in this critical moment, the GIs then unleashed a final ball into the jail, before finally hearing 
we give up. The deputies came out with their hands raised. Some of them were attacked by the crowd of angry citizens. But amazingly, there were no casualties. One GI even went to the hospital to give blood to one of the wounded deputies. The GIs then found the ballots and won the election. The GIs were still very aware of their crimes and awaited retaliation. They guarded rooftops patiently, but it never came. Surprisingly, the transition of power was then peaceful, with the defeated cogs of the machine conceding. Sheriff Knox Henry smashed up the gambling machines and forced a fair rule of law. One FBI agent came to investigate briefly, but the tight-lipped community protected its own and the case was closed. A judge ordered an investigation, but the National Guard found, quote, no evidence that the armory was entered. Reporters descended onto the small town, but they were mostly dismissed. The people of McMinn continued their lives as friends, even those they fought against, and their descendants honor that tradition today. However, Wendy Wise did plead guilty to felonious assault for shooting Tom Gillespie, who luckily survived. Wise served one year in jail and then was paroled. Another former deputy, George Sperling, was sentenced to 15 years for the murder of Earl Ford, the serviceman shot and killed while home on leave. E.H. Crump's machine was dealt a heavy loss in McMinn, which led to it eventually dissolving across the entire state of Tennessee. Bill White became a deputy serving his community in some more adventures, and then later with his wife and children purchased a familiar hunting lodge to call home. Bill White eventually passed on in 2006 after a life that would make any American proud. Today, the jail is a parking lot for an insurance office, and the McMinn Living Heritage Museum finally has a recent exhibit that embraces their moment in history. As the participants of this unforgettable event are passing on, their personal retellings are being discovered for the first time. These are what Chris the Rose gained access to, bringing out the most accurate retelling possible. So I want to say thank you again to Chris for your help, and thank you everyone for watching.